ahead of September 2023's Eastbourne edition of Art on a Postcard series of auctions and the exhibition at the Towner Gallery, participating artist Sean Worrell answers some questions put to him by Art on a Postcard. You attended Bangor Art Foundation course, being tutored by Peter Prendergast. How did this exposure to one of Britain's leading landscape painters influence how you perceive landscapes in your paintings? Mm. Well, Peter was um, ah, Peter was intense. Peter was was very very intense. I didn't really know him as a landscape painter at the time. I had just left school. I'd just gone to the Art Foundation course in Bangor which to me, Bangor at the time, was 20 miles away from where I lived on a, a small island off the edge of Anglesey. So Bangor was quite a big, exciting city for me. And having had no real exposure to the art world, knowing I wanted to do something in art, but having, unlike people who live in, I don't know, London or wherever, they would have art galleries and culture around them all the time, I had very little. Peter Prendergast was an intense lecturer a, a drawing tutor. I knew him first as a, the guy who took the life drawing classes and very intensely took the life drawing classes. When I was 17, first time I'd really encountered any formal art outside of, well, no, first formal art really. And Peter was this frightening, stern lecturer who I knew very little about in terms of his own work. And, and so approached him as, a, as the life drawing teacher he was. First I knew of Peter was him scratching around and throwing bits of his own pencils around as he was doing his own life drawing. The landscape painting of his was something I became aware of as I got to know him. He had a massive, massive effect on me and pretty much everybody who went to that foundation course not only the people who continued in, in, in visual arts, but people who went on to be musicians, to run record labels, to do all kinds of things. I didn't really get to know Peter as the brilliant, inspiring, exciting landscape painter that he was until, I don't know, two months after I'd been on the course and got used to the man in some kind of way. He was, he was scary. He was... I, I don't know, I don't know how to explain how Peter was, but everybody I speak to who went on different foundation courses tell me they never had an experience like I did. And everybody who went to that Bangor foundation course absolutely adored and worshipped both him and a sculptor called Paul Davis, who really should be mentioned as well. He was, he was as intense and as inspiring and as life-changing as Peter was. How did he do that? Did, how, was it a case of setting you free in some way? Ah, uh, no, not setting me free. Far from it. It was. It, it, it was. It was about attitude towards work. It was about a work ethic. It was about having the guts to take things on. It was about not playing safe in terms of. Oh, ha! Ah, now it was. It, it was. Challenge, about challenging yourself, about not accepting what you were doing, he kind of just, in in the most positive of ways, told you you knew absolutely nothing about what you were doing, that everything you were doing was a load of rubbish, to forget everything you knew about the first 17 years of your life, and to start again. As far as informing my landscape painting, I, I don't really think I'm a landscape painter. I did at the time when I was on the foundation course, I lived by the sea. Peter was a man of the mountains. He, his world was the Welsh mountains, Snowdonia, everything on that side. I lived in uh, Holy Island, which is a small island off Anglesey, 20 miles across Anglesey from Bangor. So my outlook was towards the sea, towards seascape and towards that beautiful line where the sea meets the sky. I, I, I've never really considered myself a landscape painter in any kind of way. Seascape was something I did when I lived on Anglesey. I don't live on Anglesey anymore. I don't live near the coast. I do like to get to the coast, but I wouldn't say I was a, a, a landscape or a seascape painter. Not, not at the moment. You immersed yourself in the music scene after relocating to London, founding Org Records 
and releasing singles for bands such as The Brian Jonestown Massacre, Cardiacs, K and Liberty 37. You also created album covers for various groups. How does your relationship with subcultures within the London music scene intersect with your artistic practice? No. Well, I never saw any boundaries between the two. I was very much immersed in music and involved in, in putting on gigs and doing things with bands when I was in Bangor. I was at concerts all the time. I spent more time at concerts than I did in art galleries, mainly because there were no art galleries in North Wales uh, at that time. Anyway, there's a better scene now. I came down to to London and started obviously as everybody would do when they came to a big city, exploring all the music venues, exploring all the options, all that was around. It, it was exciting, it was an exciting time, music was alive. Um, art was still, in terms of formal art galleries and that kind of thing, the, the YBAs hadn't happened then, the, the, whole, the whole art world at that point was very formal, very stiff. I found punk rock and I found the things that were going on around skateboard culture and street art and all that kind of thing really exciting. I found fanzine culture exciting. I started a fanzine called The Organ, which is where all records came from, when I was doing my degree at, uh, at art school. I started it with a, with a fellow artist called Marina Anthony. Um, better known to the to the general public as Marina Organ these days, a DJ on Resonance FM and big part of Org Records and such. Org Records was a, a natural offshoot of what really was a, a far bigger thing, which was the fanzine, a, a handmade art zine with lots of screen printed covers, lots of collage work, lots of hand painted pieces of artwork involved in it. We started the organ and put one out about once a term while we were art students kind of accidentally became a record label, a TV show, a radio show on Resonance FM. We always saw it as a piece of art, as, as, um, as an actual thing, a thing to hold in your hands. It was as, as important as the words and the reviews and what we were writing in, in the organ was the hand-painted covers, the way it was laid out, the, for want of a better work, the anarchic, chaotic layout of the whole thing. It was an art statement rather than just a music magazine. There was one that was um, just a screen printed t-shirt. There was a couple of magazines that had absolutely no music reviews in it. It was just pieces of art. It was a, There was one that was a 16 or 8 or however many pages. A5 magazine that had absolutely no words in it. It was all screen printing and collage. When I, was a, when I was a kid, when I was 12, 13, 14, 15, nobody told me how I could be a painter. I couldn't understand how I could be a painter. I had no idea that I could get into um, art galleries and all that kind of thing. But I did think I could make a, a living, a profession, as I'd always say to people, I want to be a commercial artist. I want to paint album covers. I loved album covers. I thought they were beautiful things. I loved seven inch single covers. I, I, and so, yes, once we started the record label, I wanted to do the album covers. I wanted to do the singles. But stupidly, I also believed in um, total artistic freedom for the bands. So quite often they'd bring in their own covers. And quite often I kind of hate the covers they came in. But the principle of it was, let them do what they wanted to do. I did start working with a band called Atom Seed, who um, I, I guess I became almost a fifth member of in terms of doing all their artwork, doing pretty much absolutely everything for them, designing their t-shirts, booking their gigs, doing absolutely everything, just so I could get to do all their, all their record sleeves and things. Not that I'm that pleased or proud of what came out of the Atom Seed period in terms of the actual artwork I don't think they, those sleeves were great. I, actually I don't think I've done a decent album cover yet, I still want to do an album cover for somebody I did lots for Org Records which is a strange thing saying you're doing them for yourself so there was about over 200 releases on Org Records so quite a few of the covers on there are mine, there was uh, record sleeves for bands like Osmium and Sand Kings and, and various other bands New England if you'd asked me when I was 13 or 14 who my favourite artist was, it would definitely, definitely have been Andy Warhol. Pop art, The Factory, the whole thing, Velvet Underground, the whole lot. That's, that's what excited me. That was a world 
that I could see a way into. It was something I could do. It was on my terms. The world of formal art galleries and formal landscape painters and uh, as much as I loved them, the world of, of Turner and that kind of thing seemed a million, million miles away from where I was at. So as much as I loved these things and I loved art, I grew to love people like Peter Prendergast and immerse myself in all kinds of different artists. Pop art and and that culture was the thing for me when I was a, a kid. And then, of course, <coughs> street culture came along. Street art, seeing the first bits of, of graffiti that were coming over via American videos and, and, and glimpses we were getting from in skateboard magazines, in punk rock magazines... People seem to think that you are a street artist yourself. Ah, but well, that's the thing. Some <laughs> people do and some people don't. You ask the street artists and they'll all stick their noses in the air and go, oh, no, he's some sort of weird contemporary artist who's stuck in galleries and that kind of thing. And the contemporary artists will all go, oh, no, he's some sort of street art hooligan. And truth is, nobody has really been able to work out what I am or what I do, and I'm, I'm quite happy with that. I'm quite pleased to not stick in any pigeonholes or really... I I wouldn't claim to be a street artist in the way that the famous names are street artists, though. So you're about proper painting, even though some of your... Well, proper painting is not not fair, because I'd say street artists were proper painters. Yeah. Um... there, There are street artists I really admire. There are street artists I admire as graphic designers... But you've you have a serious focus on your paintings. That's everything I do in terms of art, in terms of music, in terms of releasing records, in terms of writing about art is all extremely, extremely serious. I take it all very, very seriously. And the most serious of all is yes, my approach to painting. My approach to the way paint is handled, the approach to how I walk up to a canvas, the whole thing. I admire a lot of the pure street artists. I admire a lot of the purity of that scene. I was very much involved in the scene, painted on walls, painted big walls, a long time before a lot of other people who claimed to be pioneers in street art. I did it in a time when we didn't have mobile phones in our pockets and and didn't record everything we ever did or we didn't have social media to post everything on where we didn't really care about likes or anything like that. So a lot of my street art was never recorded. There was no record of it. I'm very much part of that culture. I'm very much part of, of the music culture that came out of street art. Very much part of the DIY punk scene that, that evolved around street art. So I just don't claim to be a street artist in the formal sense of the word that, that you now see. I think I'm just an artist. I'm as happy painting on canvas as I am painting on a wall. I'm as happy inside a gallery as I am hanging a piece of wood that I've painted on the street. I'm as happy as doing the the many, many art drops I do on the street and and will continue to do as I am hanging a two-metre square piece of canvas in a white wall gallery. It's all one thing. It's all about painting. It's all about communication. It's all about the things that evolve around the painting. Would you say that your approach is more in line with a fine art disciplines than a street art discipline? Well, I don't. I don't see the, the two are, are different things. I'd say my approach is very much as as intense as as somebody like Peter Prendergast would have liked it to be, or, or as intense as some of the gallery artists that I admire. But I, I don't see that some of the street artists are any less intense. In your Skyline series, you paint scenes that you are deeply familiar with. The line depicts a flat horizon, a nostalgic memory from your formative years of the Irish Sea surrounding Anglesey, whereas the London skyline, that house on Mare Street, was the site of your recent group show, a part of the E8 Art and Craft Trail. What is the context behind the skylines that you selected for your Eastbourne Skyline series? Well... (laughs) Before I can get to the Eastbourne skylines, I guess I have to explain the skylines a bit. Skyline started in 2019. I was I, I was taking part in the art car boot fair over in Margate, and I was considering Margate, looking at Margate. I really like Margate. Um, my my Turner fascination is to blame for that one, um, and I really have a connection with 
because I'm from the seaside, I have a connection with the seaside wherever the sea is. I started looking at doing something within Margate because I was going to do the Art Car Boot Ferry Margate. I absolutely adore the shape of um, the Turner Contemporary and the way it stands up in front of the sky and the sea in, in such a in such an outstanding way it's ju just a beautiful shape and to just I kept standing there looking at it thinking I was going to do a painting of it and at the same time thinking I was going to do something about dreamland as well but then it suddenly occurred to me that the thing that really excited me was just the shape it was the shape of the of, of the building against the sky it was a throwback to the time I would spend in Holyhead or Triada Bay, Anglesey, looking out to the sea all the time. I, I have an absolute fascination with the, the line where the sea meets the sky. And so I was looking up at skies, I was looking looking into those open spaces, and I did that with the, with the two Margate subjects, the... the Dreamlands and the Turner Contemporary and then brought back that idea to my studio here in London where I live in East, East London in Hackney um, I started looking at, at, at London buildings in the same way started looking above the buildings looking at the space above the buildings started to get excited about brutalism and the, the lines the shapes the way things fit together and trying to distill that down and not get engaged in the actual details of the building to just strip it completely down in to, to something that I was looking at originally when I was looking out to sea all that time ago on, on Anglesey. It's about finding the space, it's about something. Richard Kenton Webb, a painter, recently explained a similar painting that I saw of his recently, I believe he was in Plymouth looking out at the sea, as it being standing on the edge of chaos. But that when you stand on the edge and look out to that line, you're looking at total and utter chaos and you're on the edge of it. I see it as totally different. I find it the edge of calm, the edge of possibility. The, 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 there's something out there where the sea meets the sky, where the building meets the sky, where the space in between. Just the, the looking up and finding something. So the skylines evolved in that kind of way. I didn't think I'd still be painting them four or five years later as I am doing now when the suggestion that I come and do some work in Eastbourne was made I don't really know Eastbourne that well I started looking at the buildings of, of Eastbourne and of course the, the 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 pier is something rather special now piers to me is the seaside once again and to tie things up and to circle it back round I spent a lot of the time seeing the first bands I ever saw and getting involved in the music scene on the pier at Colwyn Bay, where I would regularly go to gigs there almost on a weekly basis. So piers are always very important to me. That is a glorious pier in, in, in Eastbourne. It is something special. And once again, I wanted to look at the shapes of, of, of that pier. I do want to do a lot more in Eastbourne. Now that, now that I've looked at it, I want to spend a lot more time down there drawing and painting and, and, and exploring what's down there. In your Eastbourne Skyline series, deep blue gradients form skies that support silhouettes of buildings washed in vibrant shades of pink. Why have these hues formed an integral role in this series? All the Skyline paintings, every single one, from the Eastbourne paintings to the, the Huddersfield railway paintings I did that were shown on the platform at Huddersfield Station, um, They've all been that bright fluorescent pink. That was um, because I wanted to contrast. I wanted I wanted a, something that that was saying here's the sky and here's the other thing, whatever it was, whether it was a a railway station in Huddersfield or the pier at Eastbourne or the Turner Contemporary or or something in London or or whatever. I wanted a stark, bold, bright very obvious contrast I wanted it to be two things I wanted it to be the building or the train or the station or the or the art gallery or the 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 shape of the building and then I wanted it to be the sky so it's two things I wanted it to be intense I wanted I wanted the color and not quite the flatness it's not flat the build the paintings I'm doing aren't flat um, in terms of the shape of the buildings but I wanted that shape to be vividly intense yes to really be there as something 
So I guess the, the question that people are going to say then why bright pink? Why day glow pink? Um, <clears throat> why not black? Why not why not why not a darker shade of blue? Why why not something different? Why not green or, or concrete grey or something? I like the unity. I like the colour. I like the brightness of that pink paint. It's almost, but not quite, uh, almost a punk rocky type thing. Um, I a street art even. It's, it's, it might might even be a street art thing. It's it's intense. It's 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 as intense as I can find. I I have tried it with lesser shades of pink. Not so much day glow. Not so not so much neon. Doesn't work for me. I, 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 and I don't, certainly don't want to paint the buildings and the shapes of the buildings in the actual colours they are. I wanted it to be a statement. I wanted it to be the boldest, brightest, in your face statement as it could be. And then at the same time to be subtle, to be, to, to, to glow in some kind of way, to excite. Not quite alive. No, not quite alive. It just felt right. Sometimes you have to just go with your instinct. It's an instinct. It's where you put things. It's where you place things. It's the colour next to the colour. It's it's about the relationships, the contrasts, and sometimes it is an instinct. It is it is just something that's right. And pink is right. Blue or concrete grey wouldn't have been right. Not for me. In your Eastbourne Skyline series, you strip away the layers of buildings distilling cityscapes into pink silhouettes. How does this approach intersect with your perception of the urban environment? With the Eastbourne paintings, I really wanted to strip all the uh, the Victoriana and, and the Edwardian pier away and just distill it down to the shapes. I think there's some great shapes if you can just look at the shapes. Um, not the flat shapes, even though I'm almost painting them flat. And... In the city, in Hackney, in East London, in, in, in the West End, wherever, there's so much clutter, there's so much going on, there's so much visual noise, there's so much um, eye pollution, that sometimes you don't look up, you don't look at the edges, you, don't, you, you walk past the National Theatre every day, but you never look at it. You walk past the buildings, the, the, the church steeples, um, the churches in Hackney that I've painted in, in the same way, with the vivid pinks and things. And you don't look at them. And I'm I'm kind of distilling all the other noise out of it. I'm filtering. I'm 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 saying forget about all this, this, this and this and all the all all the the other noise and look at this beautiful thing, look at this exciting thing. Concentrate on this. Your Skyline series is strongly tied to urban horizons. However, you have explored unspoiled skylines in paintings, such as She Went to Margate. Can you see yourself painting more rural landscapes in the future? Well, in terms of that question and that recent painting, She Went to Margate, that was distilling it right down back to that line I keep talking about, that bit where the sea meets the sky. Um, that could have been Margate, that could have been Anglesey, that could have been Eastbourne, it could have been in a lot of places. Um, yes, I definitely do see myself getting back to Anglesey, getting back to the seaside and coming back down to Eastbourne to paint again, going to Margate to paint, so there's a reason why Turner chose Margate, <laughs> with the way the sun, is, the sun comes up and such. I live in London. I've lived in London for for a good chunk of my life now. I've lived in, in, in the east end of London for, for a long time. The paintings I do, the, the noisy paintings, the bright, colourful, um, for want of a better term, the kind of street art flavoured paintings, all the, the, the intense layers and the peeling back and the looking, at, that's London. That's where I am. That's what I'm reacting to. But yes, at some point, I want to leave London. At some point, I want to go back to to Peter Prendergast and his, and his Welsh mountains or the seaside. I don't see myself as painting traditional, for want of a better term, constable-type landscapes. That, that doesn't excite me so much. The mountains of Wales certainly do. The sea certainly does. The looking out, the looking out beyond the seascapes uh, yes I, I do need to escape London at some point very soon I don't know when I don't know how I'm still excited by what I see in Hackney I'm still excited by a, a poster peeling off a piece of wall by somebody knocking down a wall I'm excited by layers and layers and layers of street art 
I don't particularly like graphic street art when it's all pristine and it's all new and it's all perfect. I like it when it's flaking off, when it's peeling back, when someone else has tagged it, when several people have had a go at the same war and there's all sorts of stories to, to be told underneath. Urban decay, I like the mess I'm surrounded by. As a kid, the things that really excited me <laughs> before street art was ever a thing was graffiti, you know, football culture. That's a lot of where my art comes from. So there's all kinds of elements all mixed together. Um, but yes, at some point I will retire, become a serene landscape <laughs> painter, a well-behaved landscape painter. I shall paint beautiful landscapes and seascapes, but probably not yet. Probably still too much of a punk rock noise merchant somewhere inside me. I should mention this because as we're talking here, we're talking about an event which is run by Art on a Postcard, which is happening in the gallery in Eastbourne. Postcards, I really like the format. I really love the format. I think back to the first art I ever bought, and it was all postcards, postcards out of galleries. We'd all have them as kids, as students, as young people. The only art we could really afford to buy was postcard versions. We'd blue tack them onto our walls, onto our student digs or whatever. I love the format. It's the same as a seven inch single. It's something very accessible to people. This appealed to me rather a lot to paint seven inch singles or, or CD covers or postcards. Um, I like art to be accessible. I like it to be there engaging with everyone. It's one of the things I do is um, a thing that I've now started calling 43 leaves with a hashtag which is um, art dropping, painting on found pieces of material that I pick up off the streets and then deliberately go and leave back out on the street, hang on walls, but not stick to walls. I just hang on, on nails that are already there so that people can come along and just take the paintings. I've done two or 3,000 of them now and those paintings have gone all around the world and people seem to treasure them. I like engagement. I like that art should be accessible to everyone. So the postcard is a perfect format maybe a little bit small for some people in terms of actually doing the work but a beautiful format for, for actually allowing people to have something they can stick on their wall they can put in a small frame that can be reproduced mass-produced put into repeat all sorts of things I like postcards <laughs>